Lee Chiarello with Skunk Magazine, and I'm here with Cheech Marin and Tommy Chong. Hi guys, hey. so good to see you. Um, we have lots of exciting things to discuss today. Um, you know, what a long, strange trip it's been to wow. arrive here. <laughs> still still tripping too. Right? Yeah, stranger than ever. I know, I was thinking of Salvador Dali's quote, that I don't need drugs, I am drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, I've been trying to do this kind of microdosing with LSD recently, and I was like, no, you don't, I don't need any LSD. I'm going to be sitting here with Cheech and Chong, Chong it's, and... It's a virtual LSD. Exactly. So yeah. you guys, I think you've graduated as elders now. You, nobody needs acid around you. That's right. <laughs> and I heard you want to be going more towards the illicit uh, side of things since we've, we've, we've hit the legal market. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. where's the leading edge here? Yeah, I mean, you lose it when you're lined up with old ladies getting their medication. <laughs> right. It takes the a, takes a, the romantic era. He's, <laughs> he's now on the suppository only end of it, you know. <laughs> no. I got a lot of suppositories for sale. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> see, I like. suppositories, which is really, really important. The world needs it. Suppositories but. only got a back end of this joint here. <laughs> ah, those suppositories, you know, for all the good they did, I might, I might as well shoved them up my ass. <laughs> you started at the front end, and now you're moving around to the rear. Here we go. You're thorough. Yes. <laughs> But I wanted to go back because, you know, this is a special historical moment that you guys are starting dispensaries together. Yes. I'm really, really happy about it. But I wanted to take people back, you know, those that don't know, you know, and tell us a little bit in your own words about your meeting. How we met? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go all the way back. <laughs> what version? <laughs> what version do you want BC there, Gene? Bud in the 1970s. And what was it like? I mean, well, it was an ad. I, I, <laughs> I, added, I, I answered in the Georgia Strait. It was the, uh, the hippie underground paper. Uh, uh, learn the joys of rubber clothing. <laughs> Uh, excessively hairy men need not apply. So yeah, I went there to the address. <laughs> well, it was you. <laughs> Actually, we met a Russian introduced us. Ihor. Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Big difference in countries. Ukrainian. So you had a Russian, an Asian, and a Mexican. Well, he was a Ukrainian. Ukrainian. Uh, he Ihor owned a... A magazine he called Poppin. Ma Poppin magazine. Poppin I was magazine. writing for it at the time. And Cheech was Cheech was uh, writing. He was a writer, and I had an improvisational uh, topless nightclub going. Yeah. And I needed a straight man, mm -hmm. someone straight. And so Ihor e was a customer of mine, and he uh, he said, "I know the perfect guy for you." And so he introduced us. Yeah. The rest is history. So amazing. And you have been running, Cheech. I think, you know, right now we're in this kind of revolutionary moment. Yeah. And back then we were in a revolutionary moment. Yeah. Same thing. And, right. It's the same thing. And so now you, you were leaving, you were a writer. Yeah. You know, and here you are, you find yourself in Vancouver. I mean, what did it take to get you to leave America? Were you just saying, forget it? Well, you, a lot of people are feeling that right now. Yeah, I, I, I understand. <laughs> Kind of that same, uh, and my wife is too. Let's go, let's go water source. Let's go place where there's a good water source. <laughs> that was like, <laughs> um, I I was I went to Canada originally to be a potter. I was a potter. I, I made pottery in school. I was gonna, and but I was also in uh, part of the draft resistance movement at the same time, mm -hmm. and we we refused to cooperate with the draft and blah blah blah. And so they, they were after us, you know, but they, and then so uh, there was a directive issued that anybody that participated in all these protests, which I was doing a lot, uh, would be immediately reclassified from 2S, which is a student deferment, onto a 1A, immediately available draft, would be drafted and sent to the front lines of Vietnam. That was General Hershey's directive. And I said so something along the lines of "Go fuck yourself," and <laughs> and and I was I went to Canada, but I was going to Canada originally to be a potter, and stayed there and, until uh, for three years. And that's how I met Tommy. Then we eventually came back here. It's beautiful, and and so you know, to me, you're like the epitome of that counterculture energy, and so are you, Tommy, for a different reason. Because the roots of vaudeville, burlesque, 
stand-up comedy. I just feel like all of them lend themselves to thinking outside the box. And a lot of people don't know the root of stand-up comedy was the burlesque, yeah. was, the, was the vaudeville circuit. Okay. And so there was something to, to, you know, you guys met and had this ability to converse about things that were not, that were shunned with normal society, right? A normal, you know, variety show was not going to discuss the things that you guys could discuss. And so I wanted you guys to be able to, you know, talk about that a little bit, especially you, Tommy, to, you know, how you wanted, you know, what drew you first to create that comedy improv and what was your part in this kind of counterculture? Well, I was a, a musician, you know, I was a blues guitar player and uh, we got s discovered and signed by Motown. And so when I was on the circuit with, with Motown, uh, we would went to all the, went to Chicago and, and instead of going to a blues club, I'd go to Second City. And I got turned on to, uh, to uh, the improvisational comedy. And then when I was in San Francisco, same thing. I had a band. We were playing at a strip club in, in, in uh, San Francisco called Big Al's. Mm -hmm. And uh, down the corner, down this road was the, the committee and with Howard Hessman. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I would pay my way, go see uh, the committee, see improvisational comedy. And it just, and being a musician, you know, you, you, when you learn tunes, you have to remember things, you know, you have to. And so when I would see the improvisational theaters, I would remember the whole bit. I could remember the whole thing. And, and so then I started, when I started the strip club up in Vancouver, it was originally a strip club. It was funny. Uh, I, all the clubs that I owned were given to me. <laughs> The first one was an after hours club. The guy had an empty, he had a building, but he needed a club in the basement. Yes. And so he offered, uh, here's a, hey, do you want a club? So yeah, okay. It was the second or it was the third club that I had, but this one was fully furnished, right. you know. And so, uh, yeah, and, and same thing in the, the after hours club was so, it was so uh, popular that we made a ton of money and we also got a reputation for being a good club owner. And so then the, the strip club, which was in Chinatown, was a dinner club, very high class dinner club. And that was offered to me. Yeah. Hey, you want a club? Yeah, okay. And so rather than do another after hours club, I said, uh, Vancouver never had any strip clubs. And so I, I opened the first topless which is wild because Montreal has a strip club and a church on every corner. Yeah. I lived there for five Vancouver, years. Well, Vancouver, well, it had that, uh, you know, the, the what do you call it, the, the church. Puritanical. Where you had, yeah, you had it close at midnight, all that, on Saturday night, right. you know. And so I ended up with, uh, with, with two clubs and a strip club. But, and then I got fired from Motown. And so that, that was a long story. It was a good story, too. But <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to Vancouver to work in the clubs. Yeah. And so I started working the lights at the strip club. And, you know, just being the light guy. And then I started writing the show. I, I'd see what the girls would do. And I noticed the girls would come in you know, off the street looking beautiful, young, young you know, right. gorgeous, nice nice dress, you know, you know, hip, very hip looking. But then when they put on their stripper garb, they would morph into this. Transform. Well, they'd transform into, you know, Amazon. what kind of slutty kind of oh. stripper, stripperish, you yeah. know. That's the part we liked, actually. I always have a theory, though. <laughs> but I always liked yeah. the fresh look. That was sexier to me. Yes. And so they what I did, the, the first bit I did with the girls was, uh, it was called the pajama party. And so the girls would come on stage dressed in their street clothes, and then they would change into their pajamas. And that was the sexiest thing in the whole world, you know. Right. So Seeing a girl unbutton her blouse, you know. And, oh. and so then I had uh, uh, the MC. Originally in the strip club, his name was Taps Harris, and he um, was a retired tap dancer, and he was just emceeing. Just, and here's Lola, and here's uh, right. Maureen, and blah, blah, blah. And so he never had to work hard, 
But when I started the improvisational club, I had the girls say, taps, uh, do, 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 do a little tap dancing for us. You know? right, right, right. <laughs> and so the crowd never saw, him, and he was world-class tap dancer. And so he would do a number and the audience would clap crazy and make him do an encore. <laughs> <laughs> he quit that night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Enough of this shit. That's not what I signed up for. No, it's not what I, no, it's <laughs> of this shit. I'm out of here. So I asked the, the doorman. I needed an MC. So I said to the doorman, Dave, I said, Dave, uh, you, you want to be the MC? And so Dave says, I'll do it if you do it. Okay. And I said, B before, I was just working the lights. And so I said, <laughs> oh, okay. So next thing you know, I'm on stage with Dave. And uh, then we started doing bits and we start, that I could remember from the committee. Yeah. And then when, when Cheech joined up, then he was like our, our straight guy. And, uh, and we, we worked nine months. We did nine months. Yeah. So he was the Dean Martin to your Jerry Lewis. <laughs> it, it, we, we just, it, it wasn't set up that I way. I was a straight guy. Because we played multiple characters. Right, of and we were of of what I realized after a while is what we were doing was hippie burlesque. Right. It was classic hippie burlesque, strippers and comedians. But the comedians part was improvisational theater involving the the dancers, you Which know. Which was the leading edge at that I time. So far, and I you know. created a whole new thing, you yeah. know, with the stoned part. So where, when did you first get stoned and go, we're fucking taking this on to the stage? Well, we're going to... Before we went on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Well... It's like, because... You know, it just so things would happen like that, and we maybe were, not everybody knows what the, was that the, moment. Well, the whole uh, the whole crew, you know, the acting crew, we, we all got stoned. In yeah. fact, we were doing a lot of acid at the time. Yeah. And uh, but just micro, yeah. you know, just a little bit to, to get you by the night, you know. Yes. But a lot of micros. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and That's so. What I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, exactly so when Cheech here. when Cheech came when Cheech first came in to, to audition yeah. to see what the show was about before he'd commit. And so he showed up and we were all stoned, we're backstage and Cheech walks in with this gorgeous lady. Oh, she was full length, mink coat, and brunette, just a knockout. Yeah. I mean, it looked like Hollywood. You know, yeah. Cheech comes in there, and this gorgeous lady. And so I hired him right away. I said, no, oh, he's hired. <laughs> but there's only one small variation. I came to audition them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I see. So yeah. Do I want to be here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so he uh, he saw the show and, and, and li obviously liked it. And that was the last I saw of the girl, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, was she, Sarah, was it? Sarah, Sarah, yeah. She came to say goodbye? Uh, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, goodbye. Okay, well. <laughs> I'm up in Canada then, now, so they got so, girls here too. So yeah. she she saw the comedy we were doing, and we were doing some crazy, crazy stuff because yeah, yeah. we had a we had we attracted. As soon as I started the theater, we attracted all the theater type right. types, yeah. and because I'd I'd been a guitar player, right. we attracted like this hot guitar player from Edmonton. He 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 came down as soon as he heard I was in town, right. and, uh, and and, and so, strippers. The strippers from other clubs now that was but, but would come to our club to right. jam, yeah, <laughs> sit in, you know. It's so like the old come. juke joints as well. Yeah. Right? I think a lot about. I also love the blues. I play the blues harmonica, and I uh. think about what you were saying: the African diaspora uh. and blues and the drug war yeah. and everything <coughs> that is all intermixed. It all is coming forward in one expression. Yeah. Yeah. And I often say, you know, it's like a renaissance that's happening. It wasn't that the hippies failed. Yeah. It was that it started back in the French salons. It went to the beats. It went to the zoot suiters. Yeah. It went through the blues and the jazz. It went yeah. up into the hippies. It went through the yippies. Oh my God. Yeah. You yeah. know, forget about Reagan. But now here we are. Then it got a sitcom deal, <laughs> and then that's where it changed. Right. Right. Now post sitcom. <laughs> Like okay, well, what are we what are we doing now? Yeah. We're still, you know, we're like a hundred years into this yeah. change in society, but we're still having the same conversations. Uh, somewhat, somewhat, some somewhat, some of them, some evolved. of them, we've evolved. Yeah. Let's let's hear your what your take is on that because this is so relevant right now of what you guys saw then in BC, 
and what you felt you needed to speak to and what we need to speak to now. Well, we're, back then, it was weed was uh, illegal. Acid wasn't, by the way. Yeah. Acid was still, you know, they didn't know what acid was. Frank Zappa used to do this song called It's Legal Till February. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, uh, so, so weed was highly illegal. And, uh, and so, we, what we started doing with our comedy, especially when we came to L.A., just the two of us, mm -hmm. uh, we, we sussed out the, the situation. And first thing we had to do was come up with some good Mexican material, yeah. you know, some Chicano material. Yeah. And the second thing we had to do was, was get some, because we started doing, after we did our records, we started doing colleges and that, and the only thing they would really relate to was marijuana yeah. jokes. You know, so pot that's, jokes. That's really, really and, and so that's how we, we, we morphed into that. It was, the audience really dictated what we were doing. Demanding when we do this drug humor. Yeah. Right, and you saw the need. Cause oh, yeah. Because you were breaking stereotypes, too, and this is what uh -huh. I wanted to move to, is yeah. just that you created all of these stereotypes, yeah. but then you broke all of these stereotypes, yeah. and you destigmatized it at the same time. I'll tell you how that manifests itself as going, coming into, to, I got a call last year from the Secretary of State of the state of California, and he wanted me to, they were gonna, meet, weed was illegal now, so they wanted to get the word out of how to apply for it having a, a, a distribution or a dispensary. So he calls me up and says, would you make a video so, <laughs> from hunted by the police to right. now the official face of marijuana in, right. in the state of California. I think that's a big joke. I mean, it's like, you know, how something can start out as just a joke. Yeah. And then end up being really profound. Yeah, yeah, it and is. And I think that that's like, what a trip. I mean, for you guys to live it, yeah. it is a great cosmic joke. Yeah. But this was just like, man, we need to store some weed and we need to have, you know, tits and ass and mm -hmm. we need to have fun. Well, the, uh, it turned into something so deep and so profound and so impactful globally. You've changed things forever. Yeah. Well, there was another aspect to it too, with me anyway, uh, and Cheech too, is that we were both fairly athletic and we were both healthy. And I, I had been with, you know, uh, hanging out with the with the bouncers or the bodybuilders, yeah. and uh, and so I had a healthy lifestyle. Especially with the diet, and especially with not drinking, not smoking, and the only thing that bodybuilders would do, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, would be he would smoke a joint. And so we Arnold we, Schwarzenegger made us smoke marijuana. Yeah. And so we <laughs> we, uh, we you know we we promoted not only uh, the weed, but we promoted the healthy lifestyle that went along with it. You know, subliminally and and openly in our movies you know when we were on the road we belonged to the ymca yeah and so every time we'd go to we'd come to the hotel throw our bags and go to the y work out come home do the show party yeah go to the next town do the same thing repeat <laughs> and, and stayed in shape and yeah. when we did like the movie uh, the corsican brothers you know we were in, in paris I, I would always have uh, i was a director so i always had a, a weight set on 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 the, on the set and so we would we would do the workouts, you know. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things that has really uh, been interesting in this evolution of the global cannabis industry is this green rush dynamic. Oh. And you know, six years ago, I was really sick to death of hearing everybody talk about the green rush. And what's the green rush? The green rush? Yeah. It's like the gold rush. The gold rush. Oh, the gold, oh, but green. green. Yeah, but green. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, you guys know about it. I mean, I, I was thinking to, you know, Up in Smoke and yeah. Stadenko yeah. and how you guys did this spoof on, you know, what happens when you get a cop high and they start to actually have a conscience. <laughs> they start to question their own authority. We need a lot more of that. Um, but, but, you know, this is actually happening, oh, which yeah. is so funny. Yeah, it's yeah. like you did this as a spoof, but here now we have Bill Blair, the, the drug war czar, yeah. is now making money off cannabis in Canada, which I find extremely insulting. we got Boner yeah. down here uh, making money yeah, off, yeah. Of, off of people. It's hypocritical, so is the it? Green, yes, so yes. this is what would be signified as the green rush. Yeah. And the idea that a lot of big money has come in, 
And for me, you know, cannabis is here along with mushrooms and other psychedelics yeah. and entheogens are here to propagate consciousness yes. on the planet. Well, that's a possibility. They are here yeah. to actually help us do business in a better yeah. way, as you said, to live yeah. in a better way, to actually be more holistic and whole, not sick and broken down. And as you guys said, this is these, these were the subjects you were exploring. Yeah. People thought, oh, they're just getting high. But actually, yeah. you guys were exploring these subjects long ago. So now I feel like, you know, the industry itself needs to have this discussion. And Skunk uh-huh. Magazine is part of having this discussion. Is, okay, it's not just about making money as usual. Business as usual is what's killing our world. Well, it's hard to make money in this business. <laughs> right. We're going to get to that, too. Uh, so, so just, I wanted you guys to have a chance to speak about, okay, we know this is part of evolution. Uh, we know big money has to come in to help push that evolution. Uh-huh. But now what? How can we actually listen to what the plant is guiding us to do? What it was guiding you guys to do way back when? Uh, well, I want to hear this one. Go ahead. Go. It, <laughs> it, um, the plant itself yes. changes your consciousness. <clears throat> and so the cops that were at one time, you know, believe in what they did, you know, they get high, then they realize wrong. You know, they're, they're, they're wrong. So Sergeant it changes. Sunshine. It, it changes their, yeah, Sergeant Sunshine. We did a song about it. Sergeant Sunshine was a cop. In San Francisco. A very ordinary cop. He tried to live his life like a good cop should, but someone turned old Sunshine on and very brightly Sunshine shone. <laughs> and in return, he turned on everyone he could. And that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. So, so it's just like people, like I was on uh, the Turks, you know, the Young Turks. And, and they were on, on the scene, you know, it's, it's wrong that these guys, you know, are doing, you know, arrested people and then now they're capitalized on that. Thing is, you change your, your consciousness. And that's what we did. And, and, I, and, and I was trying to tell these guys, you know, that, that you can change yourself. You can be evil one day and then have an epiphany and then change totally. Without, without problem, because biblically speaking, that's what they say, you know, when you get born again, that's right. exactly what happens. And so, and they were trying, the, the, the young Turks were still pushing, there should be some retribution, there should be some thing, and I, and, and I had to tell them, I said, do you know that song, Amazing Grace? Mm-hmm. You know that song? Do you know the history of that song? Mm-hmm. That, who wrote it? Willie Nelson. It was written by a slave ship owner. A guy, it was captain of a slave ship. He was making his money transporting slaves from Africa to uh, the Americas. On his way over one time, he wrote a song, wow. Amazing Grace. Wow. He had a complete turn. Really? And he turned around, and he, from that moment on, he was a changed person. Mm-hmm. And he, 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 he did the opposite. He, he was against all, all that he was doing at one time. And so, it, and and we does that, you know. Tune in, turn on. What does that mean? Drop dead. It means oh. that we have to change it now because it means oh. that if you wake up your consciousness, then what you believed before is no longer. It, it, it's dead. It was a mistake anyway. You see, you see. Do you think you, that boner is has uh, <laughs> made a boner? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, you know, I have no idea how they think. I have right. no idea. Right. You know, just like uh, the the people that were trying to make money in Canada, you know, with the well, MedMen is a good example. Oh yeah. You know where they where they try to you know raise a ton of money. Hey, you know, and then they excluded uh, the the Chong or Cheech and Chong brand out of their stores. It was a frat boy club. I mean, they were and all the, comparing dick sizes. That's right? all they no. They were just Seriously. raising money and keeping it. Right. Yeah. I, they, mine is bigger than yours yeah. because I'm in Australia and yeah. Germany. Yeah. And I'm and, and all they're doing yeah. No, all they're doing is raising money and, and, and skimming right. skimming the money off. Right. Okay. It's a show game. What they, they'll fall down by the wayside. Right. You know. Okay, right. now you have now yeah. And now we come along. But we're, but we're we're the real deal. Sure. And so it's not about money with us. It never was about money. Right. Yeah. If it was about money, we probably wouldn't be talk- sitting here talking. We wouldn't be in this business. <laughs> right, exactly. Me either. This it's is tough. too much hard work. It is extremely hard work. Yeah, and when is. you actually want to have a standard, when you actually want to have values, when yeah. you actually want to function with humanity, yeah, yeah. it's much harder. 
And I turned business away. I would never work with the MedMen. I would never work yeah. with the Canopy Group. Gross. I would never yeah. work with an Ignite. It's just like it, 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 it's just like music, you know. When you're playing music, if you're perfectly in tune, you're, you're fine. Just go about your business. But if you're out of tune and you keep playing, there's discord. You're gonna you're, you're gonna hear this Start discord. A punk band. It's not gonna be right. <laughs> and so what, then then what you do, you tune up. Or you just keep playing out of tune. Once you get tuned up, you don't remember being out of tune. Right. You see, you only remember the good stuff. All that's there is is now. It's uh, all the same fucking day, man. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we were just lucky enough to right. sit back and just let things happen. Right. You know, we, you know, we saw the money there and we got, the, we got the offers. But this is the first legitimate offer that makes sense to us that made yeah. sense you know but because i feel like the timing is right i mean yeah. i was going back i was reading an old high times from back in the 70s and i was you know and it was funny because at the time you know coke played as much as cannabis as much as acid as much as everything it was really about really a wild moment mm -hmm. when everything was up for grabs and everything was being discussed but but yeah i mean it seems like now is the right time yeah and I feel like it's the right time for legacy in general. Yeah. All of the brands that were bootstrapping, real deal, authentic, uh, you're the strongest brands right now. You're thinking. Yeah. Yes. And and the others are showing us a study in how to waste millions and millions of dollars and fail. Greed. Which, greed. <laughs> greed and short sightedness. Yeah, you know? That exactly. side of the that side of the road does the same thing. He just arrested Bannon for the same thing, raising money for the wall. <laughs> well, they're going to put the wall on your yacht, Steve. <laughs> <Right>. Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, yes, they're just crooks. They're crooks. Right. They could have been selling oil. They could have been selling crack. It doesn't matter. Uh, they just. And, and you know, it. you know the weird, the funniest thing about all that stuff. Right. When they get money, they have to launder it. Okay. And so when they launder the money, they're actually doing legitimate business. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so instead of going through all the laundered money, and then when they get caught, they go to jail and they, everything gets, d disappears on them. Yeah, yeah. And so if they just put the same energy in to being straight. I was, I was in prison with uh, uh, Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan mm -hmm. Belford. If Jordan Belford just used a, a, a tenth a of, of his is. intelligence and went the straight route, right. he would be, he'd be like... Warren Buffett. Yeah, he'd be <laughs> up there. He'd be up there. But instead, what did he do? He went the le illegal route, uh, like Trump. Right. He went the illegal route. Right. And they spent more time trying to hang on to what they can't hang on to. Right. Because even Belford and, all, and Trump and all those guys, what did they do with their money? They hide it offshore. Right. They don't even get to enjoy it. They can't even buy art. Right. They can't buy anything with it. They can't enjoy their lives. No, they can't enjoy anything. No. And so, so you think about all the energy that they put into being illegal. If they put a, a tenth of that into being, you know, just being illegal, like right. le, being legal like we are, then uh, so it's they come, would it's be in a new book, it. How to Be Legal. <laughs> It'll be available to the public in about a week. How to Be Legal. You have to buy 10 copies at a time, but it, it'll teach you how to do that. But you, then you also have to have a companion volume about how to still remain illicit. How to be, yeah, exactly. Is there no. any illicit things we can do? Again, again. See, that's a, that's a, a fallacy, too. Right. Our act, I was going through our, our act, you know, uh, what we did. Yeah. And our old act had some so racist stuff in it, so uh, misogynist. I mean, it was like, but it was of the time. Yes. That's what made people laugh. We couldn't do that now. And we wouldn't well, do that now. We'd be That's the evolved. trouble with this cancel culture idea is that's what comedians are built on. Right. It's by being uh, uh, inappropriate and, uh, and, and saying, the unsayable at that time so i don't know what it's going to do to to the whole kind because that's what comedy is built on right, right. you know it's so we'll see the uncomfortable yeah saying the thing that you're not supposed to yeah say. so so to, where are we headed i that? don't know we're gonna have to see but we're what it is the narrative together it's a pressure see when you when you do it it relieves the pressure yeah. you know right. like like uh, with, with what's going on now with with trump if you look at it in, in a comedic way you can laugh. I mean, I... I, I call him Twitler. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I look at this guy. I mean, he you, you know the best you, the best way right. to watch Trump? Right. Mute him. Mute him, yeah. Just mute him and then just play music or, or, watch or the play faces. something else. Watch and just, the just watch him up there. And he's Mussolini. <laughs> he's like Charlie Chapman. He's all those guys. You know, I, I thought he posing. was a phony and a crook. The first time I ever saw him when right. he was a gad about in, in New York. So, how did he break into the party? He's how? Such a jerk. I know, because daddy. Yeah, daddy, I, that's the only reason that he's there. I but he did daddy it. Daddy was a racist and daddy didn't love him either. No. So now we're dealing with an unloved little boy. Oh. And this is the havoc that he wreaks. But we're changing the narrative. And this is what I'm excited about with you guys is that you're launching dispensarias, yeah. which I feel like, you know, it definitely gives this nod to the Mexican American culture, mm -hmm. to marijuana, to, to kind of taking our culture back uh -huh. yeah. and saying, okay, this great age old uh, journey of scoring weed <laughs> is still a really important part of our lives. Yeah. And how we score the weed matters. And, and who we score the weed with matters. Yeah. And, and so how, like, I want you guys to have a chance to speak about Dispensaria and, and what has been getting you excited and getting you up in the morning now about writing this new well, narrative. Well, it, it, it's been a dream of ours since we, since we started. In fact, we had the first dispensary in our movies. You know, we had the, the, the pot cafe in Amsterdam and yeah. still smoking. Mm -hmm. We oh, had an yeah. ice cream uh, dispensary in uh, Nice Dreams. Yeah. So, so, and we had, uh, and we were, I, you know, remember I had a job rolling, rolling joints? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> no, that's I'm, I'm my best customer. <laughs> I was my best customer. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this was back, yes. back in the day. Uh, so we, we, we said, and then we did Acapulco Gold, you know, no stand to seize that we don't need. Acapulco Gold is badass weed. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, so right now, all we're doing really is recapturing our youth. <laughs> with the, the, the innocence of the movement, that's us. Wait, what we did, right. we set the stage for entertainment for movie producers, uh, directors, actors, writers. Oh, yeah, when they weird. saw, when they grew up with our records and that, they go, oh, okay. And so you got a Tarantino, you mm. got, uh, you know, uh, Fridays, you know, all those movies, yeah, Harold and Kumar, and uh, all and those that. guys, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and even even, even uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, because that's, I, I want to get a, a, a gathering of like Spigoli. Spigoli. Yeah. And, uh, Jeff Bridges and uh, you know all the oh, Seth, yeah, Seth Rogen yeah, yeah, yeah. and and, and no have a, a gathering of those guys and and, and do a round table or something. Yeah, I love that. Because do that. because we we inspired we them. That whole yeah, thing. Sure. yeah, we we inspired all you that. Absolutely, yeah. did. I mean, you, you really created a global. And, and so when it, when it comes to our dispensaries, now our dispensaries, we're we're going to mine that gold mine that we have of our of our things. So every dispensary is not just going to be a, a, a store where you buy weed like Mad Men, you know, right. very, very, you know, I don't know what you call it, but it's... Mad Men, I didn't know whether to buy weed or have my phone fixed. Yeah. In there. It's the chads yeah. and brads. I you know, it's like... Chads yeah. And yeah. They don't know what they're yeah. doing either, and it yeah. shows. And their weed was stale. Right. <laughs> and we're bad. I, mean, I didn't find any good weed there. Boof. Boof? Yes. What does that mean? <laughs> Boof. Boof weed. Boof, B O O F. That's what we Shitty call weed. it now. It's just Boof. basically shit weed. Oh. Yeah. yeah I got, I got breath, breath strips now. Yeah. The THC breath strips. It was at the suggestion so of his family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're so popular. They're so popular. When I go to parties now, and everybody's asking me for them because I, I went I to think a. It's great. I went to a. On the airplane? I went to a hockey game uh, with with a bunch of guys with our uh, the game you know the che the yeah. bud farm yeah, yeah. guys and I gave them all a bread strip. Halfway through the game, man, they had more munchies there. <laughs> <laughs> they, hey, bring more beer, more 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 popcorn, more. You give me the hot dog. You want a hot dog? <laughs> I was directing this play on Broadway, and the guy who was who wrote the play and was kind of starring in it. I got these strips. This was, well, do I have these strips? He said, oh, can I have one? 
well, yeah, okay, sure. And so see what happens. And so we were, we were finished rehearsing. We go and he says, you know, nothing happened. Can I have, I have another? I don't know, dude. Maybe, you know, we just made that. No, 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 I'll be fine. We didn't hear from him for a couple of days. He got lost, man. His wife was looking for him. <laughs> so one at a time. Yes. That's yes. my, my. Carefully. Yeah, carefully. carefully. <laughs> there still needs to be a lot of education. Yeah. And so, you know, that's what I'm excited about with your dispensarias as well. It seems like you guys are going to really focus on providing really fun, quality products, but also education, right? But, uh, and here, tacos. Here, here, here's the tacos. education. I love having a taco bar. I love it. Here, here's the education part. I'm not lazy. Like now, you know, they're wor worried about home learning and all that crap man you got a phone it has everything in there that you'll ever need you, now you can sit at dinner parties and you can't remember the name of something someone goes oh, uh, oh, they got it so my wife when she's talking to me yeah blah, 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 blah. She's, oh, yeah. no no the hairs <laughs> that's what i'm saying so so it's the age that we're living in that's why we have our dispensaries now that's why everybody's ready for them right that's why uh our 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 business really is considered essential. Yeah. It is. What's open? Cheech and Chong dispensaries. Oh, Mexican Americans, they're essential workers <laughs> in essential industries like dispensaries. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. And the other thing we're going to do with the dispensaries is have a, it's like a meeting place. In Canada, we have uh, community centers. You know, in, in every every area in Canada, every neighborhood has a community center, yeah. and it's so essential. See, and we we don't have them here, oh. you know, in so in, in America, oh. we so we don't have them here. Right. And so our dispensaries are going to act like that. Yeah. You That's know, wonderful. there'll be bulletin boards, you know, yeah. where, where you can get jobs, where you can, you know, uh, yeah. and in in books, a lot of a lot of the problems. Because we, if we had a teen center, we wouldn't be in this problem. Yeah, my my. Uh, uh, what do you call it? solution for, for especially the um, the kids at the border yes. is to make a movie and then hire the kids as actors and get them all legal mm -hmm. and, and and with their family and every, everybody else because uh, like the uh, a movie company has the, the ability to to house and clothe and feed thousands of people at the same time, idea, at the same time, and not only that, but when you when you're when you're vetting people to see who's who should be in the country and that, no one better than a casting company. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody better. They know how to jump. The they place. know Get it done. everything about you. It's their job, you see. Yeah. And so, so what I what I'd like to do, you know, is in a in a movie company is very, uh, you know, too. well you have to listen to the boss like back in the day when mgm and, and you know the the moguls they ran everything they had a moral code man and you didn't mess with that moral code you couldn't show people getting killed without you know it, it had to be done in in a, in a very moral fashion right. but so so th 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 this is what marijuana does to you you know yes. it, it it gets you thinking and it gets Makes you solving you problems yeah Get you thinking outside the box. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. is taking us all the way around to, to circle back to where we started. Yeah. You know? Like, that who's got the joint? <laughs> exactly. Oh. Where's the damn joint? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me just ask you a few things for the heads. All right. Yeah, we should. What's your favorite weed? My favorite strain? Oh, yeah, my, yeah, my. Quick, 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 okay. okay, my favorite strain, my favorite weed, okay. my favorite strain is. Marijuana, <laughs> yeah. or cannabis, or cannabis, <laughs> and sometimes some mota, okay, mota. and yesca, La and yesca. That's yeah. my, that's La my. Yeska. Yeah. It's only bad if you don't have. Yeah, it. that's it. Yeah. That's right. The only bad weed is no weed. No okay. weed. Okay. That's <laughs> gotta be a tagline. Yeah. Okay. Favorite movie that you made together? Probably still smoking. Uh, that that was a good movie. I like up and smoke because it was the first. Yes. I you know there was. Maybe fun air movies, but I that endures. Up in smoke. Up in smoke. So it's classic. Yeah, it's in, you want to bring it back. Classic. It should be looping in your dispensaries. Yeah. It is in a lot of people's and homes. That punk, that punk rock. I've, I've been at I've been I'm at so people's. Glad you <laughs> came up with that at the end. I, 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 yeah. It would have been a completely different movie with with us. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. No, we we were. 
tuned in to what was going on. I tried happening. to bring that green van down, but I couldn't get it. <laughs> ah. We know he knows somebody that has it up north. So. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. If I yeah. find him, I'll, I'll I'll put you guys in touch. Favorite experience in your career so far? Favorite experience. These are just short answers. I don't. Boy, what's your favorite experience? I don't know. I think the uh, forum concert with the Stones. Yeah, opening up for the Stones oh at the. God. I think I think that was because it took us from the little clubs <laughs> into nineteen thousand people, right. and yeah. we killed. We killed. We literally. They had no idea what was going to happen. Yeah. And we came out there and we got introduced to the to the whole Stones people. I, I that, that was that, that I was think pretty that was good. My favorite. I remember walking on that stage and going, "This is a big ass stage, man!" <laughs> <laughs> wow, we kept walking. And can you imagine us on our hands and knees doing the dogs in front of nineteen thousand people? Oh, and like was, to like to emote and to just. It to was just, great. Yeah. Send that out. That, that was, was my. What was yours? I, I like the I like the Stones or or at the Kennedy Center, you know. <laughs> Sold out two doors. We had a few. We, yeah. we played to the biggest uh, outdoor. outdoor crowd ever. What was it, 800? No, it was five. Five, five or 600,000 people. Yeah. Wow. It's hard to see the back row. You didn't see the back row. Your vision couldn't carry that far. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so I want to give you guys a chance. What do you think is the best effort that you can make? I think that you should vote. Get up out of your seat out of your house if you have to, or to the mailbox and vote as many times as you can. Mine? Yes. Don't eat the yellow snow. Very good. <laughs> it's Canadian sage wisdom. Sage advice. Don't eat the yellow snow. You learn that right away, because you're tempted a lot of times. I learned that when I went up there. <laughs> I did my time, seven months of winter. Yeah. Oh, thank you, guys. You're welcome.